Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Damon Linker of The Week, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Our special guest this week is Catherine Gale. Catherine is the former CEO of Gale Foods and is now a political entrepreneur. She is the author with Harvard Business School professor Michael Porter of The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy. Catherine, thank you so much for being here. Damon, thank you for being back. Welcome back. And um, I'd like to you know, tell our listeners that we have touched upon this matter of ranked choice voting and final five voting. And I promised you that we would get more deeply into it. So today is the day. Catherine has become a, a, uh, an advocate for, well, Catherine, tell us, you, you say it's not just ranked choice voting, it's ranked choice voting plus final five. So can you explain your innovation? Yes, Mona. And thank you for having me here. I'm thrilled. So final five voting is the name for a combination of two changes to how we vote. And I'll tell you about those changes in a moment, but I want to start with the key difference between final five voting and ranked choice voting on its own. So the purpose of final five voting is not to necessarily change who wins. The purpose is to change what the winners have the freedom to do and are incented to do while they are legislating, which is to say we looked at the electoral system and said, right now, our electoral system is designed, it helps us pick a winner. How could we have an electoral system that picks a winner and also delivers that winner to Congress in the strongest position to create solutions to our nation's biggest problems, regardless of where that person comes to Congress on the ideological curve. So this is all about putting people in a position to generate results while legislating. So having said that, final five voting is the combination of these two changes. First, we eliminate party primaries where you vote in only the Democrat primary or the Republican primary. And instead, we substitute a single ballot primary where all the candidates are running on the same ballot and all the voters, no matter whether they're registered with the party or not, get to vote in that primary. People pick their favorite, just one person, no ranked choice voting here. They pick their favorite and then the polls close, we count all the votes and the top five finishers again, regardless of party, advance to the general election. So, for example, if you have a very Republican district, you could easily have three of those candidates being Republicans, and you'll have intra-party competition. So now we have five candidates that have been selected in the primary, the first round of our election for, let's say, Senate. Now, the second change that we make is when you go to the general election, we are going to have a dynamic, diverse debate of ideas and constituencies and visions, this benefit of having five. But what we need to do now is figure out who should win. And with five, it's a little bit more complicated than we would think, because what we don't want to do is elect someone who doesn't have the support of the broadest number of people, which is to say if you have five candidates which is good for competition, what if you accidentally, in a sense, have the winner uh, win with only 21% of the vote if the vote splits relatively equally between all five? That means that more people wanted someone else than wanted the winner. So we have to get around that issue. And the best way to do that is to use an instant runoff voting system. What that means is we use a ranked choice ballot and everybody gets to rank these candidates in order of preference, something we do naturally, as in this is my favorite, but if I can't have that person, well, I, you know, I'd be pretty satisfied with my second choice, all the way down to your fifth choice, something like over my dead body, do I want that person to be my senator? And then when the polls close, all the first choice votes are counted, 
And if one of those five candidates has a true majority, no problem, which is to say over 50%, no problem, the election's over, they win. However, if none of the five has that true majority, then the instant runoff system begins. The candidate who came in last place is eliminated, and voters who had selected that candidate who has now been kicked out of the race have their single vote transferred to one of the remaining four candidates who is still in the race, which is to say it's transferred to their next choice. Then we count the votes again and look for the majority winner, and we continue eliminating the person in last place until we determine who has the broadest support of the greatest number of voters. The result of this is a candidate who, a winner who goes to D.C., answering to the voters in the general election, not just a party primary, and answering to a broad coalition of the general electorate, and therefore having the freedom to work collaboratively in Congress to solve our biggest problems without being guaranteed to lose their party primary the way it is in the existing system. Okay. Now, in your piece at uh, that you wrote in the Harvard Business Review, you said um, you made the point that 80% of U.S. House seats um, are uh, decided by um, – uh, that eighty percent of them are are safe for one party, um, and uh, they are really the the primary in those cases is the whole election, uh, and only about twenty percent of voters par- even participate in primaries. And you point out that this creates incentives for uh, the winning candidate to appeal only to a narrow slice of the electorate, and uh, and it discourages cooperation. It discourages reaching across the aisle. They worry about being primaried. Um, But so my first question would be, um, wasn't this always the case? I mean, we've always had two parties. Uh, We've long had the primary system, but within living memory, we had a lot more across the aisle um, compromise. So are you sure that it's really the system of voting, even with our partisan primaries, that's at fault and not other things that are happening in our society? Yes. uh, Super important question. So Mona, there are definitely other things that are happening in our society that are making us more divided than we've been previously as a nation. The reason I don't talk about those things is because they may not be things over which we have control, not something we can achieve to make a difference. So if the system is dysfunctional and this division is built into the system, the question becomes, where in the system do you intervene? And a lot of places, if you could intervene, would be helpful, like if you could intervene and make the media um, somehow be something that everybody agreed on what the facts were. But you can't do that. So we look for where it's powerful to intervene and where it's also achievable, and that's where changes to how we vote are both powerful and achievable. And here's why the voting system itself has gotten, has become a worse contributor to this polarization. One, there is a natural and and laudable, really, um, tendency among humans to get better at what they do. Companies get better. Companies innovate. People get better. They figure out, um, they develop their talents more. So what's happened is over time, the parties have optimized their way of competing in a way that reinforces these divisions. Because years ago, the parties actually didn't know in the way they do now that the best way, the most predictable way to win elections was to turn out the base and depress the middle, and they liked to tack to the center. So when you, and and now they realize that is not necessary. Mm -hmm. In almost all districts, you don't need to do that anymore because the districts are either naturally sorted for one party or the other, or they have been politically gerrymandered for one party or the other. So you never need to come to the center. And they don't bother. The second thing is, and it's more certain to tur- to depress turnout among swing voters if you can. By the way, the other thing that makes this worse is that because the natural sorting of districts has increased and because gerrymandering 
while a practice that has existed, you know, since uh, Elbridge Jerry, early governor of Massachusetts, it's become, uh, it's been optimized itself by the data that we have. So our gerrymanders are better. Mm, interesting. And therefore you combine the technology making gerrymanders better. You also combine a race to the bottom of what is considered acceptable behavior in our political system with the fact that you, you're more likely to win if you do it through division and demonizing the other side than if you emphasize any common angle. And that means that this system uh, delivers the behavior that we see in Congress. Okay, interesting. All right, now, uh, one more thing from me, and then I'm going to turn it over to the panel. Um, the primary race in New York was not your system because it was just a, a ranked choice uh, voting primary. Um, so it wasn't the two-stage process that you're, you're mapping. Um, but, um, but some people are saying, oh, it's, you know, it's going to discredit ranked choice voting. And others are saying, no, despite the fact that the reporting was, was sloppy and, and some of the uh, administration was poor, it actually worked well. What's, what's your view? So I, I agree that you know, the, the administration was sloppy and poor, and that has put a temporary bad taste, um, especially for people whose first exposure to thinking about this new way of voting, ranked choice voting, came from the mayoral primary. We'll definitely overcome that because you know, we're just a bigger country than that. I mean, it doesn't all come down to one single um, instance. So I think it worked. Having said that, I was not uh, in favor of putting ranked choice voting in the New York primary because when we make structural changes to our system, we lead people to expect something from them. They want to benefit from it. And when you use ranked choice voting on its own in a primary, you get more of the negatives of ranked choice voting and you don't get the benefit of freeing the those elected from it of what I call the tyranny of the party primary, which is to say that we already know who's going to be the mayor of New York right now, Eric Adams. The general election is months away, but we know it's not going to make a difference, which is crazy if you think about a democracy. The general election should always be the deciding election. And the, the mayor that comes out of this system, again now, Eric Adams, will need to have as his primary constituency registered Democrats who vote in New York's mayoral primary, which means no independents, no Republicans, and even the Democrats who don't participate in the primary are not people that he'll do his best to think of them. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. People try to do the right thing. But any reelection chance still goes through the party primary, and therefore ranked choice voting doesn't change that. Got it. Really interesting. Okay, Damon Linker, I think you're a skeptic, so why don't you weigh in? Uh, thanks a lot, Mona. And yes, it is good to be back, uh, especially for such an interesting discussion of something so important to our democracy. Um, I, let me make clear from the outset that I think there are a lot of good ideas here. I'm especially fond of the first stage in this two-pronged uh, proposed reform of our electoral system. It, it's sometimes called an open primary or a jungle primary. You just have everybody run and and then you pick some number of those who finish as kind of your final cohort, and then you have some second round of elections afterwards in order to determine a true majority winner from among that smaller set of candidates. Um, I, I like that first round idea. Where I dissent from this a little bit is is in the idea of relying on final five or ranked choice voting for the second round. And there are a few reasons for this. Uh, first of all, I think it presumes far more knowledge on the part of voters than it's reasonable to presume. I I don't think most voters uh, pay enough attention to politics to not only have a favored candidate, but a sense of who each of the many candidates is and also their preferences in reference to each of them vis-a-vis -vis every other one. 
So what I think you will end up with using a system like this is a lot of people sort of randomly picking their second, third, fourth choice. Second, and this is a much bigger concern of mine, we live at a time of a great deal of distrust of public institutions. And the problem, in my view, with ranked choice voting is that it makes elections less transparent rather than more. So you have the former president of the United States running around lying about how there was all this voter fraud and he was he had the presidency stolen from him and his supporters because there was this cheating going on. And so in that context, to then move to a system where you're not just counting up votes to determine the plurality or majority winner, but actually need to do this very complicated behind the scenes uh, reallocation of votes as each of the candidates is eliminated, and then saying, presto, at the end of the process, this is your winner based on this group of people who behind the scenes are doing this complex counting for days afterwards, even if it were done automatically very quickly by computer program, it can't help but increase suspicion and the opportunity for people to claim that there is something uh, nefarious going on if they do not win. Okay, the Damon, third, I'm yes. going to stop you there. Wait, hold off on your third point. Let's let Catherine answer the first two. Okay. Yeah, Damon, uh, good to meet you. And uh, again, super great points. And we need to do diligence this idea, you know, aggressively. It's a big change. First of all, does this, is this uh, system beyond the reach of sort of a typical voter? And basically ranked, final five voting isn't used anywhere in the world, um, but they also don't have our constitution, which guides the rest of our government, which makes final five voting work for as a complement to what is set out in the constitution. So I would say we do know, however, that ranked choice voting is used in Australia. It's used in Ireland. It's now used in Maine. It will be used in Alaska. So their voters haven't had an experience with it yet. But there's no way that the rest of America is not as capable as the voters in Maine, the voters in, you know, Ireland and Australia. It's something people naturally know how to do. Now, you're right. At first, it is more complicated. I mean, there's no way to say it's not. People haven't done it this way before. So something new is complicated. But that's when it becomes important to evaluate the trade-off, which is, Going to the new system will require education. It will require, you know, some new behavior on the part of the voter. The question is, is it worth it? So we can stick with what we've got, and we know that the existing system delivers people to Congress who are forbidden to work with each other, which is to say the party primary of each side. The only thing they agree on is don't work with those other people. And so therefore, we know that our existing system, we cannot solve our problems in a sustainable way. So then you say, is it worth going through this education to get to a place where people in Congress can have the leadership and, the, and use their talent in a productive way? Now, the second question that you had is distrust of public institutions. No question, huge distrust right now. I would tell you that we need to look deeper for where that distrust comes from. I'm going to suggest that it comes first from the fact that the results are not there. Why aren't they getting things done? Why don't I think my children's life, lives are going to be better than mine? So the fact that we don't get results from our government is probably the first reason people don't distrust. Uh, distrust sorry. And, and in the case of then switching to final five voting, where you have to show the results Again, it takes a little bit of education, but it doesn't have to be a behind-the-scenes um, calculation at all. There are, There is, by the way, standard programming where the computer runs all the algorithms. It's auditable. And when the results are presented on websites, you can show graphically exactly how the votes change. The, the New York Times actually did a very good job um, of showing that in the mayoral race. So it'll be a little bit of an adjustment, and basically the trade-off is we're going to deliver people Congress to Congress who can do the job they were sent there to do. 
Okay, Damon, your third point. Okay, this will be my third and final point, which I will then conclude with an alternative to the scheme that, Catherine, you've been proposing and ask you why not that as an alternative. Um, the third, My third uh, problem with ranked choice or final five voting is that um, elections are supposed to be gauging public opinion and translating public opinion into representation. And... I think that the results that you get with ranked choice voting can be highly arbitrary and contingent on when candidates are eliminated. I'll explain this with reference to the New York City election. Uh, those who don't know these candidates in the audience, uh, I, I hope you can follow along as best you can. It won't take very long. Uh, but this is how things worked out in New York City. Um, first, you had Andrew Yang eliminated. Uh, I believe he came in fifth. So he was eliminated. His votes were then reallocated Um and the result after that was that the left-wing candidate, Maya Wiley, ended up clearly in second place uh, with Eric Adams in first. Uh, Yang's reallocated uh, votes, uh, no, so sorry, Wiley began in second place. Then Yang, when Yang was, was eliminated, his votes were reallocated, and the result was center-left candidate Catherine Garcia was in second place, but only by less than a percentage point. Now, if Wiley had just barely managed to be second, uh, which could have happened because of absentee ballots, that would have then made Garcia third and her votes would have been reallocated instead in the next round of eliminations. And so the bizarre result you would have gotten in that case would have been that the winning candidate, Eric Adams, would have won by a larger margin uh, than he ended up winning, even though uh, Wiley's voters would have very much not wanted uh, Adams to be the winner and would have preferred Garcia. So the, the takeaway from this perhaps somewhat confusing description of these candidates is that when you have a situation where you're relying on candidates being eliminated and they're extremely close to each other and very different ideologically, whose votes get reallocated to which candidate can have kind of cockamamie results that don't seem to track with public opinion. And so, you know, the idea that the far left candidate coming in second would result in uh, an outcome where the more centrist candidate, Adams, wins by a larger margin than would have happened if the more centrist uh, Garcia candidate would have been second. That doesn't seem to make much sense. So if you put that together with the other two, I'd leave you with a question. If there are problems that we can uh, admit with uh, ranked choice voting, why not have the French presidential system, which, like yours, begins with an open or jungle primary where everyone participates, but instead of going to f a final five and then having ranked choice voting, they simply go to a final two. And then they have a runoff, and by definition, any race with only two candidates will result in one of them being the majority winner. And we saw that play out very nicely uh, about three years ago in the French election, or four years ago now, in the French election, where in the final round, you had uh, Emmanuel Macron, who was a centrist candidate with a brand new party, had really nothing to rely on as far as a party infrastructure to win, going up against uh, uh, Le Pen, the far right candidate. And Macron decisively won because all of the, as if you will, anti-Le Pen voters coalesced around him. And so a brand new party with a new candidate of the center catapults into victory in that system, which seems to me exactly the kind of thing that you would like to see happen. And I think all of us on this podcast would like to see happen in an American context. So why not that as an alternative? What do you say, Catherine? I say I love this conversation. So <laughs> first of all, Damon, uh, your point that elections need to translate the voter preferences into who should represent them. I want to say we are asking too little of our elections. We need elections to translate voter preferences into who should represent them and to put 
those chosen in the best position to be able to do, do the job we're sending them there to do, to Congress. And in that situation, actually, our current system is worse in both, in both situations, which is to say, we get cockamamie results all the time in the existing system. Give you an example. Mike Castle, uh, Joe Biden became vice president, you know, in 2009. Mike Castle was sort of known to be the next senator from the state of Delaware. Uh, he ran in his 2010 party primary, the Republican primary, and he lost. And he lost to a Tea Party candidate named Christine O'Donnell um, of a tiny number of votes in this low turnout primary. And then because Delaware has a law, the sore loser law, which says if you lose your party's primary, you can't be on the ballot in November, no matter what the voters of your state want. He couldn't even compete in the election when the voters were going to choose. And he was the most popular politician in the state. So it was widely expected that he would have won. And therefore, because of the way the rules are set up, he was eliminated first when he really should have been there at the end. The same, we see the opposite where Joe Lieberman lost his Senate primary and then because his state, Connecticut, didn't have a sore loser law, he was able to compete in the general election and then he won. Lisa Murkowski lost her primary. She was able to compete as a write-in in the general election and she won. But we're always seeing people eliminated in odd ways through the existing system and that will continue. Believe it or not, there's no perfect system of voting. Uh, the Marquis de Condorcet in 1750 started working on, you know, these new methods of voting. And since that time, that's, you know, before our country was formed, people have spent their entire careers on voting theory and public choice. And I'm going to sum it up. I mean, Bill might choose to differ with me, but the only thing they agree on after, you know, 300 years is that plurality voting, which is what we currently do, is bad. So point being, there's a zillion ways to vote. Final five voting is, I'll argue, the best system for our constitution. So again, no cockamamie results. You know, from, there's, you, the, however you look at it, they could be odd, no matter which system you choose. And then as far as what they can do, Final five voting delivers people to Congress free of that tyranny of the party primary. Now, coming back to your proposed solution, which is let's use the French system, that's a better system than what we have. It is not, however, good enough for our divided country right now or ongoingly because, by the way, I'm talking about Congress. Final five voting is designed for Congress. There are different things we would need to do at the presidential, but that's not what we're focused on now. And what we uh, basically, if you have only two, which is what California has already done, it doesn't disrupt the duopoly enough. There is not enough competition to hold either side accountable, and the election still pretty much happens in the primary. So the Macron kind of results would be, you know, sort of the exception that proves the rule that top two doesn't deliver in, in changing what the winners have the freedom to do and are incented to do. Linda, are you... Uh... <laughs> Are you persuaded that uh, this is a this is a great idea? Uh, no. Uh, let me start by saying, any system that requires me to listen to a TED talk, which was excellent, Catherine, I loved your TED talk, um, to fully uh, grasp, or in which I have to rely on a an explanation in the New York Times to figure out whether or not it worked, is not a um, a system that I think will work, uh, work in, uh, in a country such as ours. I mean, we are a group of people, uh, and certainly I won't put myself in this category, but everybody else on this podcast, I think, can safely be assumed to have an IQ that is probably at least two standard deviations from the norm. Um, and here we are trying to explain this system and not all of us agreeing on what it means and then you take this system and you apply it in a country uh, in which, you know, we, we've got uh, abominable uh, levels of understanding of our current system. Uh, we have people who don't, you know, have a, a sense of American history. I, I mean, I just think this is, 
you know, we're coming up with a solution to a problem that has, first of all, much deeper roots than the system that we use to be able to pick our winners. Um, it is far more uh, pernicious and pervasive than uh, simply the, the methods we use to select our leaders, but also a system that has worked reasonably well, I would say very well, for almost 200 years. I mean, what we're complaining about is changes that have taken place, particularly at the presidential level, that really only go back five years. I mean, it, you know, the presidential elections uh, and even our elections for Congress have produced uh, Congresses that did get things done. And yes, there is a uh, kind of partisan divide. And yes, party primaries uh, seem to favor uh, picking people from the extreme left or the extreme right, depending on which party you're talking about. But I think, you know, again, this, this has to do with much more deep-seated problems um, in America. And it's one that I think we're trying to create a fix for that um, most Americans, most American voters will not grasp uh, and will not embrace. So, go ahead, Linda, might, Yeah, might I push back for a moment just uh, in, in the sense of inquiring? So when you say it's not going to work, what do you mean? Like, what does that look like when it, quote, doesn't work? What it looks like is, frankly, voters being confused and turned off and I think actually depressing voter participation. I think, you know, it... <sighs> How you describe this and the way in which people have to think and have to think on election night to try to figure out who won an election, um, people want to know. I mean, it's, it, it's like watching um, a basketball game. And, you know, you want to know at the end of the game who won. Americans are used to figuring out at the end of an, an election, and maybe, you know, it'll take hours, it might take a few days, but Part of the biggest problem uh, in the last election was how long it took uh, to actually get the results of the elections to know who actually won. That was a major factor in sowing distrust. So having it not work means people trusting the system less, being less likely to uh, participate in the system, and even when they participate, not necessarily uh, participating with a full and complete understanding of how the system works. We know how the system works now. You go and you vote for the person you want to win. And maybe you lose, maybe you win. Uh, but having a system where your votes are going to be reallocated, you have to make second, third, fourth, and fifth choices. Um, I just, I really think you're, you're creating more problems than you're solving in this kind of a complicated uh, regime. Could I could I jump in here for a second, Catherine, and just uh, respond that um, voter ignorance um, is always with us, and it it can be used as an argument against any system that requires public participation. Right? You know, the, we're not going to change the the average IQ is a hundred, no matter how many changes we make. But um, at least here, you would change the incentives. So. Um, so at the moment, um, we do have a problem with the candidates who win only being answerable to a tiny sliver of the party that nominated them. Uh, so say 20%. Um, whereas at least if they have to have a jungle primary, they will have to appeal to somewhere closer to the middle in hopes of, of getting elected. And so when you change the incentives, you may change some of the bitter polarization. Yeah, Mona, thanks for saying that. And Linda, again, your points are well taken. Here's what I'll say before I respond to perhaps some of your specific points. When when Mona just talks about the incentives, let's just reimagine the benefits of this system. Because there are trade-offs, some of which you've articulated, Linda, the fact is we shouldn't do this unless the benefits are worth the trade-offs. 
So I think I might not have done a good enough job on the benefit. So again, this isn't about changing who wins. It's about the winners have the freedom, to, what they have the freedom to do and are incented to do. So let's take our existing system and pretend that nobody different wins under final five voting. But we'll take uh, 10 senators and they're the same senators and they now know that their next election is going to be final five voting. They, so they were elected under the old system, but their next election is going to be final five voting. Therefore, they know that uh, sort of last year, before the system changed, they could only vote one particular way on a compromise consensus, highly negotiated immigration bill or infrastructure bill or uh, you know budget uh, package. And that was dictated by, it's actually 10% of voters who are the, as my three-year-old says, the boss of us. Um, and well, so- Thank you for that correction. So, yeah. yeah. Well, no, no. I understand why you said 20. We won't get into that now, okay. but it's 10%. Um, and, and the point is they can't afford under the existing system to vote for things that behind closed doors they support. They, they can't match that behavior because they are pretty much guaranteed to lose their primary or they know they'll get the threat of being primaried from further to the right or further to the left. So they are highly constrained in the options that are available to them despite their talent, their knowledge, and their desire to move forward. Now, um, when you... So, so basically we get this gridlock or you, you, know, you can't get people over the line on a bipartisan consensus. When you change this system, you have these same 10 people who now form a bench of people off of which can come the gang of four, the gang of six, the gang of eight on any issue because they are answering to their general electorate. So they're answering to the 65% of voters who turn out in November. And even if they're a Republican in a red district, guess what? They're winning coalition because red districts are mostly 60% Republican, 40% Democrat. And right now those 40% of Democrats are completely disenfranchised. They have nothing to say about the state of things. But once you have final five voting, they can be part of a winning coalition. Everybody is re-enfranchised. The general election becomes the most important. And when we look at what that does to the senator, to their life and their opportunities, it's transformative because they can see a path to victory for themselves in signing on to highly negotiated, you know, deals on complex challenges that previously, that currently just isn't available to them. So it, look, final five voting doesn't, you know, guarantee that Congress solves our problems, but it does end the guarantee that Congress will not be able to solve our problems. Okay, Bill Galston, I'm sure you have many thoughts. I do, and I think I, I win a medal for patience. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> 38 minutes and 59 seconds. <laughs> You're the cleanup hitter. Yeah, right. Well, I, Was that my fault, Bill? Did I talk too long? No, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Uh, I guess uh, I would describe myself not as a skeptic, uh, as Damon did, but rather as an agnostic. And because an I'm an agnostic on this and many other issues, I'm an empiricist. Uh, speaking for a minute as a political scientist, not only is it the case that there are no perfect voting systems, not even one, you know, and uh, I absolutely agree with Catherine on that point and several others. Uh, it is also the case that it is extremely difficult to predict in advance just how the incentives created by a new voting system are going to work out in practice. And for that reason, we can make plausible conjectures about a new set of incentives but we won't really know unless and until we give it a fair try. And that's where our system of federalism has an opportunity to shine. 
I think that Catherine is proceeding correctly, as some previous reformers have. Uh, let's let's create final five uh, systems uh, in half a dozen or perhaps even 10 catchment areas that are big enough to make a difference and try over time two or three elections to see what difference it actually makes uh, in the electorate and in the behavior of members of Congress who emerge from this process. We won't know for sure because you have to make some contrary to fact assumptions about what would have happened or not happened in the absence of the system, but you can make some plausible inferences if there are major changes in the behavior of members of Congress. If Catherine turned out to be right about the new incentives to create new winning coalitions, uh, I think we would all agree that that would be a step forward from where we are right now. Uh, so my position is, let's give it a try. Nobody's saying that this should be universally adopted. I don't think even Catherine is saying that without, without enough demonstrations and pilots uh, to be able to make a compelling empirical case that this represents a substantial improvement on the status quo. Uh, a century ago, the progressives put all sorts of new voting systems and new structures into place that were designed to do X and ended up doing Y and Z. And over time, Y and Z, including party primaries, by the way, yes. <laughs> so came, mm -hmm. you know, came to seem you know, more, you know, more costly than beneficial. And many innovations have that character. So uh, I'm an empiricist. I'm a federalist, and I would like to believe that I'm an optimist about the capacity of the American people uh, to deal intelligently with change, which brings me to my second point. And that is just looking at the New York mayoralty. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that the voters of New York City found the system so daunting and complex as not to be able to, to make their way through it. Au contraire, uh, I, my assessment, just looking at the detailed coverage in the Times and elsewhere, is that they behave very rationally and sensibly within the context of the, the incentives created by the system. And you know, I'll give you the most outstanding example. During the final month of the primary, uh, Garcia and Andrew Yang, in effect, ran as best buddies. And each was sending strong signals to his or her constituents. If it comes right down to it and I don't make the cut, this is the person your vote should go to. Guess what? It worked. You know, when Yang was eliminated, uh, the second choice of the Yang voters was overwhelmingly Garcia, and that's what propelled her from third place to second place and made the final two, as it turned out, possible. And so that is an excellent example, I think, of voters paying attention, drawing inferences from signals sent, and acting reasonably on those signals. So... I would set to one side fears that the American people aren't smart enough to deal with this system. If there were, if there were trust reducing features of the system, they had less to do uh, of the election in New York. They had less to do with the system and much more with two other factors. First of all, the outright incompetence, which continues a longstanding uh, tradition of the New York City Electoral Board, which is crammed with party hacks and you know, devoid of election experts. And number two, the absurdly long time that New York City gives for absentee ballots to be received and counted so that you have a 10-day to two-week gap between the election and the announcement of the results, whatever system you have, which is nuts. 
Yeah, we had actually that issue with a number of states during the 2020 presidential contest where some states like Florida, you know, had received and counted and and booked all of their um, absentee ballots by election night. uh, So proving that it absolutely can be done and other states taking, you know, days and weeks. So that's a really good point, Bill. Okay, Catherine, um, you... um, Tell us what happened with Alaska, because I believe you had a big influence on Alaska's adoption of of their system. And then um, point us toward the future. Uh, how is the Laboratories of Democracy thing going? Where, where, where should we expect uh, innovations to flower next? Oh, Mona, thank you. Uh, first, two things. One, Bill, excellent cleanup. I loved it. <laughs> two, uh, just a note to those who are the skeptics Here's a way of thinking about the benefit of final five voting that I believe is enormously compelling in a democracy, especially the United States, which is to say right now, voters aren't engaged in part because why do something that isn't worth your time? 83% of general elections for the House don't matter in any way, shape, or form for the general election. So why should voters be engaged or care? Now they won't all care, but the point is what final five voting does is it makes every single general election for Congress in the entire country matter every single time. The decision is always made in November. It is never made in a low turnout primary. And that is what democracy should deliver is a system where when voters show up, their vote makes a difference. And that might in and of itself lead to some more engagement, but we absolutely can't have a democracy where we continue to basically have people participate in a charade that is currently November elections. Okay, so Alaska. Uh, Alaska became the first state in the country to adopt final, it's not final five voting actually, my previous work called for four, so it's final four voting, and they adopted it by ballot initiative in November of 2020. Um, and it's a story really of of many people in Alaska, but I'm pointing to one man in particular, Scott Kendall, uh, a deeply engaged uh, political uh, leader who saw what was going on in our politics and read my 2017 report with Harvard Business School and translated uh, that prescription into a ballot initiative that he led all the way to the win, you know, with so, with so many others. And what happens there is that the incentives change immediately. So Lisa Murkowski, for example, hasn't been elected under this system yet, but her next election is going to be under this system. So what it changed for her is that she knows that even though she is being primaried by a uh, Trump-endorsed challenger, she's not in danger of of losing in the first round. She will live to make her case to the general election voters in November. Whereas if they had left the old system, she might have felt that she was going to choose between adjusting her behavior to appeal to enough voters in her primary to keep her seat or, you know, going as is and and being guaranteed to lose in the primary. So now the general election voters will make the case and Lisa Murkowski knows what her election uh, is going to look like. By the way, she's still not guaranteed to win in the general, but she's guaranteed to have the entire state make that decision, not a narrow slice of party voters. Um, And then the way we go forward is we basically work for more Alaskas. So my organization, the Institute of Political Inno- for Political Innovation, is working to seed and incubate campaigns with local leadership in multiple states around the country. And we do them both in ballot initiative states and legislative states. And I will s- put myself on the line and say that the goal I have is a minimum of four states to uh, pass this final five voting package in November of 2022, because as Bill said, and you are right, Bill, I love the federal system. I love the laboratories of democracy, and we should see how this works. If you have four states plus Alaska, now you'll have 10 senators, you know, depending on the states, you'll have 50 representatives or, you know, a great number more. And we can see if they go there as, yes, passionate Democrats and Republicans, but people able to work pragmatically together 
and and that they feel accountable to their general election and that they know they'll have competition if they don't deliver those results. And if we see that, then we'll know that we should continue. Fantastic. Catherine, this has been a great discussion. Uh, We went much longer than I planned, but it was really uh, worth it. And so I'm calling an audible. We will leave China uh, for another time and uh, move now to our final segment, which is our highlight or low light of the week. And I would like to start because I came to you last last time, Bill. I'll start with you. Uh, My... You know, my nominee for noteworthy article this week is a piece by Kevin Drum. Uh, I ran across it in various ways, but most accessibly on today's Real Clear Politics site, uh, arguing that the conventional wisdom among political scientists and others about asymmetrical polarization is wrong. That theory states that Republicans have moved farther to the right than Democrats have to the left. And so there's been more radicalization on the right than on the left. And Drum puts a fair amount of evidence on the table that challenges that conventional wisdom, particularly in the area of social and cultural issues. Uh, It will generate, I suspect, a robust empirical as well as ideological debate, and it should. Okay. Damon Linker. Uh, I I will begin simply by noting that uh, I also uh, was very fond of Kevin Drum's uh, post on that subject and wrote an an entire long column of my own about it as well. So this has definitely been a major debate this week, and it's a a good, fruitful one. So I'm glad... um, that uh, Bill singled it out. Um, For my selection, I'm going to point to um, a poll, a very big, robust poll that was released this week by a a relatively young uh, polling outfit called Echelon Insights. I believe it's run by uh, center-right types, but uh, it's very reliable, good uh, upstart firm. And Kristen really, Soltis Anderson, I believe, and uh, I forget the name Patrick of Patrick Ruffini is involved. Patrick Ruffini, in, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, um, and uh, they released a very large a bunch of numbers this week uh, about various aspects of the electorate, very much worth readers looking for this, uh, echelon insights and, and digging through the results. But I want to single out one uh, one graph in particular uh, that actually Patrick Ruffini uh, tweeted out. You, if you look him up on Twitter, you can probably track it down pretty easily. Uh, headlined, uh, only 20% of Generation Z would support a center-right party. And there's one tidbit in here in particular that I wanted to highlight um, uh, for our our listeners and also for fellow panelists here, it's really quite striking. What they do in this uh, aspect of the poll is they break the electorate down into, say, five parties, green, a green party, a labor party, which is sort of like where Joe Biden is, an Excella party that's kind of like a Michael Bloomberg position, a conservative party, which is pretty much the Reagan uh, fusionist stance that a lot of people on this podcast have a lot of sympathy for, and then a nationalist party that is pure Trumpian. And the interesting thing about this is the conservative uh, line, the kind of Reaganite position. According to this poll, the silent generation is 45% conservative. The boomers are 19% conservative, Gen X, 18, millennials, 16, and Gen Z, 5%. This is really quite striking um, because the other uh, segments are rather surprising in their own way. The Excella segment uh, is highest among Gen Z. So there are a lot of, who knew that Michael Bloomberg was tapping into the pulse of the Gen Z voters out there. Um, but then also the nationalists are at 15% for Gen Z, uh, same for the millennials. Uh, but that's not great, but it's, it's, uh, it's not anywhere near as low as the kind of Reaganite conservative. So it, it shows, that that uh, th- that category of voters is is really a big function, a big factor in 
uh, a lot of the kind of ideological changes that we've seen in the country over the last decade or so. Right. Well, where would they where would they even get a Reaganite uh, conservative point of view these days? I mean, it's well, not being offered by the bulwark print at right? the bulwark. <laughs> yes, at the bulwark, and uh, and here on this podcast, yes, and, exactly. Uh, a few other little redoubts, but basically, uh, they're not they're not hearing it. So it's that's not a shocking poll to me. But all right, Linda. Well. Um, that was excellent, by the way, uh, Damon. Um, learned a lot on that, and I'm going to look at that one. Uh, my um, recommendation is a little bit uh, more mundane. Um, it's from the New York Times, first of all, and it's by Nate Cohen. It was an article a couple of days ago on July 6th that asked the question, how convenient should voting be? The court ruling leaves no clear answer. There has been so much panic about uh, the Voting Rights Act and whether or not it has been officially gutted, uh, whether or not it uh, is turning us back to the the Supreme Court decisions are turning us back to a uh, Jim Crow era that I thought the New York Times piece was a kind of sober uh, analysis uh, showing that uh, the case uh, was not the case that was decided last week having to do with Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act uh, was not the the terrible disaster that uh, that many even on the center left have been claiming. So I would recommend that um, to our listeners. Okay, terrific. Um, I'm looking nervously over my shoulder at the rain coming down because last week at this time we had a thunderstorm, lost power, and and it was a disaster. So I'm, I've got my fingers crossed. Um, all right. So my, um, uh, I'm also going to draw attention to a new poll. Um, this one from the Public Religion Research Institute um, about religious identification in the United States. It's got a lot of very interesting information, and some of it is um, contrary to some trends that we have been hearing about for a number of years. For example, um, the decline in the number of Americans who identify as Christian that we've seen um, over the last number of years has now reversed, and there has been an uptick in um, the number of white mainline Protestants, which is interesting. The number of white um, uh, evangelicals is still declining, but there's been an uptick among, as I say, um, uh, mainline Protestants and some other denominations, which is which is interesting. Um, the percentage of those who call themselves unaffiliated or nuns uh, reached a high of 26% in 2018, but has since declined to 23%. So that's kind of interesting too. You can never really, you know, uh, write the obituary for religion because uh, it has a tendency to to uh, have staying power. Anyway, there was there was also interesting data in this about. Um, various religious groups, how they identify politically, um, the share of, uh, for example, of evangelical Protestants in the Republican Party is getting smaller and smaller, not larger and larger. So that's interesting. And finally, um, the, they have uh, how religious groups fared in terms of higher education. And um, so here's a datum. The, the group that has the second highest um, level of college and graduate school attainment is Unitarian Universalists. They're number two spot. Anybody care to guess who's number one in America? Anyone? No? Okay. It's Hindus. <laughs> they have the highest level of uh, college and graduate school completion. So anyway, recommend this Public Religion Research Institute uh, study. And I want to thank Catherine Gale for a great conversation. Uh, and thank you, one and all, for listening. Kindly rate and review us. I can be reached at Mona Charon at thebulwark.com. I read all of the letters. I don't get a chance to respond to all of them, but I do read them and appreciate the feedback. Thank you so much. We will return next week as every week. <laughs> <laughs>